Hello, you good people. Hello, everyone. Friends. Lovers. Yes, thank you for joining us. Today is Sunday. This is Five Minutes with Robert Naser and Amy Naser. Hello. And you know who you are. You are right where you need to be. We need to see you in the chat. And I'll tell you why we need to see you in the chat. Not only is this an extra special episode loaded with all sorts of goodness, but we're up against the competition. I need to know who is out there. So please say hello in the chat. Let us know that you are here. I'm just making sure my monitors are up so I can see everything. And if you can see everything, you know we're uh, we're looking a little different today. Mm -hmm. I think we're looking a little better today. I think we're looking a little more stylish. I don't know. What do you I think? think so. Let us know. Today is Sunday, April 24th, 2022, the 114th day. 114th day of 2022, your best year yet. You have 251 days left to make it so. 245 days until Christmas and 67 days until Ocon. Yeah. I know the chat's going to be a little sparse because we're up against the that amazing. guy. The guy who's going to be at Ocon. Yes, the amazing Yaron Brook. It's like, no, you don't need to listen to him tonight. Listen to us. You'll see him in 67 days at Ocon. Just kidding. You can listen to him anytime. Thank you, though. The chat is up and running, and I do appreciate that. And uh, Brian says, definitely awesome look. Thank you. Well, Amy looks. Amy always looks good, but she, um, she encouraged me to look good, too. And that's part <laughs> of what we need to talk about today. So no hat today. You don't get the hat. I do have the red power tie. Oh, yes. Although... The power heart tie. It's not quite the <laughs> power tie that most men go for when they said, I'm wearing the red tie. I'm wearing the power tie. Alpha male action just for you on 5 Minutes with Robert Naser. 58 days until summer. Yes. Two months. What yes. does that mean? It means spring is... Like, we're in a month into spring. If you're not enjoying your spring already, get out there. The weather has finally turned around in Michigan. Here in Motown, we had snow on Monday. Uh, Bonnie's in the chat. She knows what I'm talking about. Today, it's in the 70s. I'm a little warm here in the studio. I've got the air turned down, but we did that a little bit late. <sighs> yes. Thank you, Brian, for the compliments in the chat. Thank you. Very much appreciated. And on this date, on this date, April 24th, in the year 1800, they established the Library of Congress. <laughs> now they, they had a little tiny bookshelf. They did. They actually <laughs> did because... You say, oh, you joke. It was the library in Congress? It actually was. 1800, President John Adams approves legislation to appropriate the massive sum of $5,000. They were so much more reasonable back then. I know 5000 was a lot more then than now, but still, to purchase such books, this is a quote from the legislation, such books as may be necessary for the use of Congress. The Library of Congress was established to be the library... Of Congress. Mm. It's the craziest thing. The first books ordered from London arrived in 1801 and were stored in the U.S. Capitol, the library's first home. The first library catalog dated April 1802 listed 964 volumes and nine maps. <laughs> Twelve years later, the British Army invaded the city of Washington, burned the Capitol, including the then 3,000 volume Library of Congress. They burned the Library of Congress. Former President Thomas Jefferson, who advocated for the expansion of the library during his two terms in office, responded to the loss by selling his personal library, the largest and finest in the country, to Congress to recommence the library. The purchase of Jefferson's 6,487 volumes was approved the next year. <sighs> Very... Very cool. And I did not know. Did not. I know the Library of Congress is this amazing library. Everybody should be taking advantage of after it. After all, the Congress is the people's house. It's our library. But I didn't know that it was actually originally just a modest library that was a resource for Congress to use. I wish that was still what was going on. And you may think, well, without the Library of Congress, though, without the Smithsonian Institution, without a few of these central repositories of knowledge, who would do it? But this is my second tip for you. The first one is Library of Congress, LOC.gov, is really a cool website. All sorts of resources. It really is the people's library. You can go there, research things, do that. Mm -hmm. But if we had no Library of Congress, what would we have? We would have what we already have, which is the Internet Archive. Now, some of you are familiar with archive.org as a place to look up 
old versions of web pages and, that, and that's cool i've got a couple of websites that i created that are no longer exist but i can go to archive.org and pull up any old version or at least one that they scanned and they scan everything very cool but also at archive.org they've got libraries in fact they've got access to almost every library uh, university library in the country most of the public libraries in the country and nowadays it's 2022 these are lending libraries you could actually borrow books and you're borrowing digital versions you can only read them as long as the borrowing lasts copyrights are preserved but you can find just about anything there if you've never gone to archive.org or if you haven't gone there in a while mm -hmm. follow the link in the show notes it is all too cool and and it's it's yours it's in your lap it's available it's a free gift yes and speaking of the library of congress that it's a funny uh story and not terribly funny story but <laughs> you know uh, dr leonard peacock um he was willed all of I Ayn Rand basically told him do whatever you would like to do with with my papers and um, at some point they decided after she passed away to bequeath them to the Library of Congress mm -hmm. well uh, Dr. Peacock submitted to them like for instance all of the papers all of the handwritten papers that Ayn Rand when she was composing the Fountainhead yeah she gave them the manuscript of the Fountainhead except for the first page and the last page he wanted to keep the original so he gave them copies yes but he gave them the, the whole handwritten manuscript of the Fountainhead yeah until uh, some years later they um, they knocked on his door and demanded the originals <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you just, just put that in the hands of the government as a gift, and here they are now going to bully their you, way. You gave us that for free, and that's not good enough. <laughs> what? Do you like my blood? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. One the, more reason why, as much as we love the Library of Congress, we like archive.org better. So there, there's a couple of stolen pages in there from the Fountainhead yeah. that the uh, government took. <laughs> so, so go up to the front desk, the head librarian of the Library of Congress, and say, yeah, I want to see those, because... Like if you're right. gonna if you're gonna grab them if you're gonna snatch them and threaten Leonard Peikoff with fines in jail, I want to see the damn things. I demand satisfaction. <laughs> also on this date, April twenty fourth, happy birthday to Jack Blades. Now I know one of our biggest patrons, one of our heaviest patron Patreon supporters, knows exactly who Jack Blades is. Hopefully a bunch of you do. Of course, outstanding rock and roll bass player, lead singer, member of Night Ranger. And also Damn Yankees, which was an interesting group. How do you put Jack Blades, Tommy Shaw, and Ted Nugent together in a band? But, of course, I could see it. Night Ranger is in my heart and soul because when I was in a cover band, we would cover the song Don't Tell Me You Love Me. Great song, great riffs, amazing guitar solos, which we couldn't even come close to. And, yeah, I guess the theme of the song, Don't Tell Me You Love Me Because I Don't Want to Know... Okay, we were young, and we didn't, you know, it was, it was edgy, it was catchy, but it really is a great song. Happy birthday to Jack Blades. Outstanding musician, outstanding bass player, lead singer on that particular song, and they shared lead vocal duties in that band. Uh, for example, Sister Christian was sung by the drummer, I think. It wasn't Jack Blades. Um, and he, the drummer wrote the song about his baby sister, Christy. In case you've ever wondered, what do you mean, Sister Chris? What does it mean? Motoring, what's your price for flight? These lyrics are... But it has been explained in interviews. It was originally Sister Christie, his little sister, didn't want to use her real name in the song. The the uh, One of the other band members misheard it anyway and said, what do you mean, Sister Christian? And it stuck. Same thing with motoring, which was really just his euphemism for cruising around in cars. It's not as ridiculous a song as you think it is once you know the origins. A bit of a bit of pop rock schmaltz, but uh, don't tell me you love me is one of my favorites. Happy birthday, Jack Blades! Also, happy birthday to Kelly Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson, the first winner of American Idol. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not a big Kelly Clarkson fan in the in the sense that most of the music she does is not my style yeah, it's, of it's music. It's a little bit down and it's a little bit over dramatic. <laughs> oh, I but, don't. It's, but, well, you know, it's, it's know. well it's, sung. Yeah, I mean, she has a very lovely voice. Yes, but, you know, when we talk about pop music or pop schmaltz, it's, it's just uh, great music. Come just, on, schmaltz, where's your manners? <laughs> just, it's just not my style. Yes, it is not our cup of tea, but I know that we could appreciate it. But what I love about <laughs> Kelly Clarkson is she wins the first American Idol. And a very popular television show continued forever. Big deal. A very big deal. And yet she says, you know, my version of winning is just being on stage. 
And that goes back to the conversation we had a week ago when we said, you know, the greatest thing when they would invite you to get in the game when you're, you know, in school, in sports, walking by the playground, whatever it was, it wasn't so much whether you won or lose, although that's great, it's important, we can do the whole trophies thing, but just being in the game, it's a metaphor for life. You want to be in the game. Yes. What I love about Kelly Clarkson is she just loves being on stage. She loves singing. Yes. She loves doing the doing. And, that is right. And you know, being the first winner was a pretty big deal, too. Yeah, we do have a, a question on, um, on from YouTube. Stephen asks, do you like be- the song Behind Those Hazel Eyes? I don't know the song. Oh, okay. Please enlighten us. <laughs> no, no. Well, we were a garage rock band, so of course we covered Behind Blue Eyes by The Who, but no, I don't know that mm. song. Scott asks, or says uh, that Breakaway is a great album. Well, I, that... I, it's another artist I should look up, but either way, happy 40th birthday to yes. Kelly Clarkson. It's also National Skipping Day. Yeah. You now, know, that's skipping. not skipping class or skipping stones. That's <laughs> literally walking and or then skipping work. feeling so much joy that you start skipping. Now, right. everybody should be out there skipping today. I do that. I've got chalk art, so I'll set up the, I forgot the word for it, the uh, game with chalk art. Hopscotch. hopscotch. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I'll do hopscotch because I draw hopscotch. Skipping, I'm all for it. If you are secure in your masculinity, mm-hmm. Don't let the girls be the only ones. Guys, get out there, do that. That is right. Incidentally, I'm a total sexist. I think there are differences between men and women, but I also think that men can do everything women can do, and women can do everything men do, and men can even wear makeup and have their hair styled for a show. This is correct. It can happen, and we will talk about that. (laughs) But before we leave National Day, it is National Pigs in a Blanket Day. So Mm -hmm. if you have hot dogs in the refrigerator, and if you have those roll-up croissant rolls, yes. you can make your own pigs in a blanket. Or you could go out and buy pigs in a blanket. And you could eat them with your pinky out. And the only reason that matters to me is that I can't do that starting tomorrow because mm-hmm. I am starting a new super yeah. strict regimen. Yeah, I, I've been eliminating sugar from my diet, which is really good. Everyone should do it. Sugar tastes wonderful, Yep. Um, especially if you're eight years old. But, you know, as you grow in life and your DNA breaks down, it's not good for you anymore. <laughs> Now, as usual, this all ties in together. Did I, what, How many days did I say till Ocon? 67 days. Well, yes. I'm determined to meet a certain fitness standard by Ocon. We just went to the Ayn Rand Con in Europe. It was held in London. Yes. We went to ARC UK and hung out with those guys. Yes. But given the time of year, we didn't go into any swimming pools. We didn't go to the beach. I didn't need the beach bod. <laughs> I look good, but yeah, I'm, the, not, the, I'm not the, beach ready. The objectivist groups in the, in London are not actually a bunch of nudists. <laughs> no, but a lot of them are super into fitness. <laughs> yes, so they are. in 67 days when Ocon happens, I need to be beach ready or hotel swimming pool ready. We'll be in Washington, D.C. I don't think they'll let us swim in the Potomac, so there won't be any beaches. But, mm. you know, you get the idea. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. anyway, if you have hot dogs, bake them in a blanket because it's pigs in a blanket day. Finally. What are we listening to this week? Now, the fun thing for me, what are we listening to this week? Mm-hmm. I've mentioned before my favorite music, my favorite rock band is the band Yes. And there's a podcast about Yes called Yes Music Podcast. And it's yeah. my favorite music-related podcast. I listen to it every week. And what was fun is, like three times ago, three shows ago, so four weeks ago, they did an episode, and it was the weirdest thing because these two got there's two usual hosts. Mm-hmm. One of them's British, one's Canadian. You know their voices, you know their accents. But these two guys get in and announce themselves as those guys, except it's like two goofy people with American accents. <laughs> and they start saying the strangest things. And I finally realized, even before they they uh, said it, was, oh, it's April 1st. <laughs> so it was kind of a funny show. Again, it's my favorite podcast. I was a little disappointed that there wasn't a regular episode, but it was funny. That was funny. Next episode they have on Rick Wakeman's kid oliver wakeman because oliver wakeman was actually in the band for a while even though pretty awesome people associate yes with rick wakeman but oliver wakeman was in the band in the early 2010s and he talks about his time there he talks about interesting things next episode i go to listen but once again i'm like this isn't right this isn't what i'm expecting to hear and it turns out they played an episode that was 10 years old 10 years old Mm-hmm. Well, they sounded different 10 years ago. The intro music sounded different. The host sounded different 10 years ago. The co-host that they now have didn't even exist. Well, I'm sure he existed, but he wasn't their co-host. Point is, yeah, whoa, that really threw me too. So 
I went onto their website, Yes Music Podcast website, and I left them a voice message. I said, oh, the April Fools was very funny, and the Oliver Wakeman was great, and this latest one made me think, well, I've been podcasting for over two years. They've been doing it for 10 years, and looking how they improved, listening to the improvements over 10 years made me think, you know, another eight years, I'm going to be damn good too. So congratulations to Yes Music Podcast. What was fun was they took that as a voice message, They ended up making it the opening of the latest episode, so I was real happy. I'm on the Yes Music podcast. They even gave me credits in the uh, show title. So very fun. If anybody's into Yes or progressive rock music, I do recommend Yes Music podcast. The other thing we're listening to this week, just real quick, is some notes about tomorrow by Leonard Mm Peikoff. Well, actually, we listened to that earlier in the week, and then later in the week we did a show about it, which you can watch or listen to. It's on YouTube. Some notes about tomorrow with James Stevens Valiant. And co-hosts Robert and Amy Nacer. Yeah, those uh, that those you know, James Valiant and uh, Robert and Amy Nacer, a good good team. <laughs> I think we've been making a good trio. We've done this now six or seven episodes. Yeah, those are on those are uh, every Friday at three p.m. Eastern Standard Time mm-hmm. on the ARC UK channel, yep. Ayn Rand Center UK channel. And links are in the show notes for this episode that'll be posted immediately after the show wrap. Yeah. Finally, mm-hmm. we did a rerun. Well, we did it on the Life on Earth show, which we yes. hadn't done it on before, but a couple <laughs> years ago, remember I said we've been doing this two years, a couple years, oh my gosh, Jennifer's in the chat. I Yay! wonder if you're in Wrapped Up or is she I... multitasking? Oh, so cool. Know. Hi, Jennifer. I mean, hi to everybody, but yeah, I did yeah. not expect to see well, Jen- I mean, we've got Jen- a lot of Jennifer. Jennifer is, here. you know, one of the most devoted supporters of Yarn Brook. She's like in solid. That is right. If if I guess he must have wrapped up. Maybe not. Either way, Jennifer, <laughs> glad to see you. And... uh Oh, Sandy says she's going to Ocon. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Hooray. We talked about our, our friend Sandy when we said we had a weekend that we spent up north, most mm-hmm. beautiful parts of Michigan you want to go to, and we were yes. hosted by the lovely and gracious Sandy, which we're enormously grateful for, and it's so cool that she's going to Ocon. That is so cool. We're, we're finding more and more friends are going to this convention, this Ocon. It's going to be great. But real quick, just to wrap we did a rerun of our show on aphorisms. We did this on Five Minutes with Robert Naser mm-hmm. and Amy Naser. And by we, that means Robert. <laughs> and yet, when we went to redo it for Life on Earth, for Life on Earth. with Robert and Amy Naser, it was missing the Amy Naser on Thursday. Uh-huh. If, you, if you saw it, you know, Amy was under the weather. Mm. She, I, I she had, had a migraine a, that came on suddenly right before the migraine. show. And Amy's not prone to migraines. <laughs> and this was one of those interesting migraines where it affects your vision. It gives yes. you aura, like a Yeah, and it spots. affects your it affects your speech, and you feel like you're having a stroke, but you're not. I've had the I've had it once before, so I knew exactly what was going on. It was no thing, but although it was like, you still worry. Why is this happening right now? I don't I don't need this to happen right now. So, so. if you see the Thursday show, it's like it's only half as good because it's only me. <laughs> But I thought it was pretty damn good anyway. Links yes. are in the show notes. Earlier this week, which will connect to everything. I always say that. And usually it does. Earlier this week, I'm on Facebook. I'm in the Ayn Rand group. You know, we're big Ayn Rand fans. And somebody named Cecil, this is public, so I'll use his real name. If that is, it's probably not even his real name. Who knows? Not everybody is as desperate for their identity to be stolen as I am. But somebody posts this. See what you think of this one says, happy weekend all. There's a debate going around about whether one can have a right to do wrong. And the following is given as an example. A guy takes his place in the checkout line with a full cart. I assume he's talking about a grocery store. With a full cart while being aware that he's just ahead of a tired woman carrying triplets with just one item in her shopping basket. I would have put the triplets in the shopping basket. But okay, take it for what it's worth. And he says, I was thinking this example is based on a mistaken assumption that the guy has an automatic natural duty to let the woman go ahead of him. He goes on with the question, but I answered him back. I said, the right in question is political rights. You have the political right to do all sorts of things that aren't morally right. And I thought that was a good distinction, but he asked me to clarify. I said, as to the example, the guy in question is almost certainly morally wrong. But no, he has no automatic natural duty, using his expression, no automatic natural duty to be courteous. What makes it reprehensible is that he's squandering, he's wasting an easy, non-sacrificial opportunity to be kind, gracious, civil. I thought that put the matter to rest, but a lot of people kept asking questions. So I clarified a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The value of courtesy, politeness, civility, decorum, 
and the irrationality of eschewing these values may not be obvious, but the obligation is to himself, to his own standards of behavior, to the type of man he's chosen or wants to be. There are countless reasons to be courteous, considerate, benevolent, generous, civil with others. That's right. And it brings to mind these two paragraphs from The Ethics of Emergencies, from the book The Virtue of Selfishness it's by from Ayn the, Rand. Yeah, that one writer, Ayn Rand. That Ayn know, Rand she's, gal. She's pretty good, actually. She's uh, the best. She really <laughs> is. So, from The Virtue of Selfishness. If you think, maybe I gave him the wrong answer. Maybe I should be thinking, he might have a sick kid at home, or his wife is impatient for him to get home, and feeling really lusty, or, you know, he may have some really good reason not to give way to the gal in the line. And that's all true. That's all possible. The reason I answered the way I did is because of the point I want to make tonight. But first, let me quote Ayn Rand. And I know, I know there are Ayn Rand fans out there thinking, yeah, he has no duty, and he should emphasize the fact that he has no duty by not letting her go ahead in line. I know those people. I know these people who don't use their turn signals to indicate lane changes, and they've told me, I ran into another one this week, who said explicitly, no, no, no. If you let them know what you're going to do, they just cut in. They just cut you off. I never use my turn signal to indicate lane changes. He said it in just that voice, but probably not with that much eloquence. Just that that voice. Ayn Rand, Ethics of Emergencies, (laughs) Virtue of Selfishness, she writes, By elevating the issue of helping others into the central and primary issue of ethics, altruism has destroyed the concept of any authentic benevolence or goodwill among men. It has indoctrinated men with the idea that to value another human being is an act of selflessness, thus implying that man can have no personal interest in others. That to value another means to sacrifice oneself. That any love, respect, and admiration a man may feel for others is not and cannot be a source of his own enjoyment, but is a threat to his existence, a sacrificial blank check signed over to his loved ones. The men who accept that dichotomy but choose the other side, the ultimate products of altruism's dehumanizing influence, are those psychopaths who do not challenge altruism's basic premise but proclaim their rebellion against self-sacrifice by announcing they are totally indifferent to anything living and would not lift a finger to help a man or a dog left mangled by a hit-and-run driver who is usually one of their own kind. And uh, so I went on real quick here. A rational man, a gentleman, does help a man or a dog left mangled by a hit-and-run driver. And he does open doors and offers a place in line to a tired woman carrying triplets with just one item in her shopping basket. No sacrifice required, nor accepted, nor implied. That kept coming up this week, even outside the context of this discussion, and made this conversation irresistible. I was talking to, um, well, actually, I'm going to skip that bit for now. Um, But it came up again in in the, uh, not the Ayn Rand group, but a more general group. Uh, It even came up recently in the shopping cart question. Do you return shopping carts? How do you treat the wait staff? Answer this in the chat. Do you return the shopping cart? How do you treat the wait staff? Do you let ladies have the seat or the place in line? I have a theory that very few people in the five minutes audience wouldn't, but there may be compelling reasons. And if there are, I want to hear them. Amy right away said, well, you know, the guy may have an important reason yeah, not yeah. to let her take his place in line. Yes, to get a, get to a wedding, you know. To get to a wedding. His uh, his uh, loved one is in the hospital. Yeah. And he, you know, so, I mean, there, there's all sorts of, you know, contextual reasons. But, yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, without those sorts of situations, and you have some, t- you have an extra moment to spare. Yeah. And why Jennifer not says, give poor yourself, doggy, so. Yeah, why not give yourself the opportunity to do something that... Um, is engaging and meaningful yet non-sacrificial. Right. And to me it spoke to the bigger question of have you designed yourself? Have you designed your life? Here's a question for you. When do you like to dress up? (laughs) Do you dress up for dates with your partner or friends? 
Yes. When you go out, do you dress up for formal events? Do you dress up for Halloween? Do you dress up every day? Just every day deciding I want to look a certain way. You know, I've said before, if you want to keep your partner, if you want to keep your mate, it's easy. All you need to do is keep doing the things you did to earn her in the first place, to win her in the first, or him in the first place. That's a little harder said than done. It takes effort. It takes will. It takes a decision. But I'm not a dressing up kind of guy. We mentioned Yarin before. He always says, I'm not a dressing up guy. I never wear a necktie, etc., etc. I know that feeling. I like comfort. I've talked about my comfort zone, which is large. It's big. I have a big comfort zone. On the other hand, I like dressing up. And I feel real good with a necktie on right now. And it's nice that, uh, you know, Amy yeah. did something with my hair more, which is why I don't have the usual <laughs> hat on today. <laughs> I like it. his hair. He's got the uh, the um, Brian Ferrier, Mads Michelson uh, look, you know, with the one strand coming down. Pretty cool, huh? Now, here's a so question classy. for the chat. <laughs> and this reminds me that I need to do better. Here's a question. Don't you think Amy deserves a guy who looks like this and not a guy who looks like the guy who was on last week? <laughs> Stop. I'm thinking I, uh, she does. She deserves a little well, better. And I need you know, to be a little it's, better. It's, I need to yeah, do a little better. This is the thing is that, you know, for, for over two years now, I've been working from home. And to be completely honest and transparent, I've turned into a bit of a schlub. And... Uh, we're, you know, we're, I'm, both, we're both a bit schlubby. I'm wearing t-shirts every day. That's yes. not cool. T-shirts and T-shirts are great. And, and I've, I wouldn't be wearing uh, them if I thought there was anything wrong with them. But. Yeah, no makeup. You, you notice I'm wearing my contact lenses. So so lovely. And, uh, I, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things where I really, uh, you know, it definitely makes, you feel, makes a person feel a little bit more alert and focused and a bit more in touch with your higher standards when you're dressed up. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not going to start wearing a necktie and a dress shirt every day. But I need to do that more often. A little bit. A little bit of an upgrade. Dressing up. Formal clothes. Yeah, and especially, you know, since the pandemic and, you know, people staying at home. And, you know, it, it's... It, the, and we'll get into manners here in just a bit. Robert mm -hmm. has some wonderful information. But... Um, but yeah, it's time to relearn manners for all of us, I think. It's why yes. I like the word gentleman. Because mm -hmm. when you say the word gentleman, it has so many values attached to it, uh, including dressing well. Uh, not necessarily makeup, although Amy did my makeup today. I don't know how that's mm -hmm. showing. I thought she was going to do something much more radical than she did. Maybe <laughs> next time. Robert wants eyeliner and mascara, oh, and I'm going to deliver. <laughs> it's going to be fun. But seriously, you wear makeup when you go out. Not A lot of guys don't wear makeup unless you're younger. You're probably not used to that. <clears throat> but makeup for going out or being, <clears throat> excuse me, being on stage, mm -hmm. which was when I was used to putting on my own makeup, was yes. when we were in a band, even in small clubs, because of the lights there, which don't don't do any favors to you, you, you got to put on a little bit of highliner. You got to, and in my case, very light eyebrows. You got to give them a little color. Uh, and again, dressing up or even costumes. I've never been a costumes guy, and I've had to get used to wearing costumes at Halloween because it's fun. If you can get yourself over that hump, if you can get out of the comfort zone and do the things, <coughs> you know, style. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I need to yeah. get the cough button there. <clears throat> um, I know that I need to be more stylish, and I'm going to be working on that. I need to have a little more class. I'm a classy guy. I'm not rude. I'm good to the wait staff, but I could do better, and I need to do that. These things are values. They're actual values in life. It's been fun watching shows, watching shows like The Gilded Age or The Paradise uh, I know Amy watches Downton Abbey, shows like Upstairs, Downstairs, where you have people who act in accordance with the role they're playing and dress every day in a shirt and tie or a certain kind of outfit, even if they're not working. They have certain personal standards they mm -hmm. follow. And yeah, I'm feeling like I want to look at my personal standards. and I love my personal standards. I love the guy I am. Could do a little improving. Well, I've got to tell you, you know, Robert is not... The normal guy, guy, you know, he he doesn't, you know, hoot and holler at the television for a, a sports ball game, you know, he doesn't, you know, eat, you know, like an unkept, disheveled person, 
Um, <laughs> you know. No, I'm very repressed. It's <laughs> no, funny too. No, you you have a certain uh, you know much. You you're more graceful than most gentlemen, I think. I try not to uh, fall too low standards, and especially not if I'm spending time with you. Mm-hmm. But the best way to do that is just not to do it. There, uh, I don't know if I should bring up this example. It's not in my show notes. But, but the first thing that yeah. comes to mind is mm-hmm. Amy once bought, I think she bought it for me. It was a gift, Christmas something. Mm-hmm. She bought me a book called Fart Loudly <laughs> by <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. Yes. <laughs> Poor Richard wrote a book called Fart, or a pamphlet called Fart Loudly. That's right. And it was an advocacy for living large and being bold and not letting things like natural functions uh, repress you. Don't be staid and upright if it's compromising your joie de vie. I still won't do that in front of people, and especially not in front of my spouse. Right. I'm not criticizing anybody I mean, who that's really you know pretty high doesn't standards. have that when, standard. When you're living, when two people are living together in a house, and they're basically in the house most of the week together, um, well, it's actually it's quite an achievement, I would say. Well, we've had the conversation <laughs> before, and I even thought maybe Amy gave me the book as an entree into suggesting, well, we should be less repressed about that kind of thing. I don't no, know. No, as much as pretty, much as I accept the idea, it's just not. We're still me. quite. Rep- we're, well, I should say we still have certain standards when, when it comes to those sorts of. Um, well, and that's digestive a, functions. Uh, that's a silly version, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm just never going to get to the point where I say <laughs> you should tolerate anything that happens because we've been together so long. Why should we care about? Uh, Je- Jennifer doesn't want to be our friend anymore. She says. Uh, not in front of me either, please. Oh, okay. Oh, I guess okay. we're not going to get that close. Well, <laughs> that's what that's what I've got some quotes on the subject that I've got to share because they're some of my favorite quotes, and a few of them were new to me. Looking this up, but the first one was from Robert Anselm Heinlein. Why do I sometimes catch Heinlein in my throat? Robert Heinlein, one of my favorite authors, great all-around guy and great science fiction. But Robert Heinlein said, formal courtesy between husband and wife is mm. even more important than it is between strangers. Yes. Now, Amy and I, as I'm sure you've noticed, we have an enormous comfort level with ourselves. We're not repressed. We tell each other everything. We're completely open. But we are polite to one another, and yeah. I agree with Heinlein when he says formal courtesy. Well, it depends on what you mean by formal. Maybe that sounds like it's going a little far, but formal courtesy between a husband and wife is even more important than it is between strangers. Now, when we had the it's episode really good. good Company, mm-hmm. in which I quoted the great Brian May, the philosopher Brian May, astrophysicist <laughs> and lead guitarist of the band <laughs> Queen, when I quoted him as saying... Um, Take care of those you call your own and keep good company. In his great song, Good Company, take care of those you call your own and keep good company. And what I said at the time was, and I originally said this in our episode, Allies, treat your allies better than you treat your enemies. Mm. How many people do we know that do more infighting than they ever actually do trying to solve the evils of the world? No, 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 no. Did I get enough no's out there? Treat your allies better than you treat your enemies. And treat your kindred spirits better than you treat random strangers. And the closer to your inner circle, the better you want to treat those people. Again, don't be repressed. And if you feel like you're repressed and you can't be yourself in front of somebody, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. But you should treat your allies better than you treat your enemies, and you should treat your kindred spirits better than you treat random strangers. I had a conversation earlier with somebody with whom we have uh, some disagreements. And it's funny because it's one of those relationships where despite the disagreements, we stay engaged. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have an explanation for that. I think it's a relationship that's in progress. But we had a disagreement about how this person was treating a third party. And I'm like, why don't you treat this person better? 
well, why do you stop picking on him? And the response I got was, well, oh, this guy's picking on me. He's picking on us. He's picking on people I care about. And I totally get that. Again, take care of those you call your own. Be loyal. Except in this case, I didn't really, I, I still don't think it's justified. I still don't think it's fully warranted. And I, my, my eventual final thought was, you know, you've got to be willing to say me first. Because it's too easy to say, well, you first. And I posted about that, these you first strategies. You know, I'll, I'll be nice to Johnny when he starts being nice to me. Or I'll be a better husband when my wife starts being a better <laughs> wife. Tit for tat. <laughs> or I'll, I'll do a better job at work when management starts treating me right. No, does, does this yeah. kind of approach, does this ever work? Ever? No. That's the Amber Heard way of relationships. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh, it's burn. Wow. Uh-oh. I might I get in trouble know. here if anybody is, a, is, a, is on, on Team Amber as opposed to Team Johnny. <laughs> mm. I'm not on either team, but I haven't really been following it. I mean, I... Yeah, yeah. I like Johnny Depp. I, I like Amber Heard, so what do I know? They're, they're good uh, psych cases of psychology. <laughs> yeah. Now, now again, it's different between your allies and your enemies. And I, I did make the distinction, since I'm applying this to non-combatants, in a police situation or a military conflict, you know, you put down your weapons first is a reasonable and proper and even necessary expectation but you don't deal with your allies the same way you deal with your enemies and if you've decided this person is an enemy write him off and, and stop right letting him live in your head rent free and engaging all the time unless you believe that at root all relationships are adversarial mm, right yeah, you have to. Um, oh. I mean, it's it's the it's the Donald Trump uh, rules of love. You got it. You got to be the alpha male all the time. It's the only way to win in this world. The way this world works. Oof. Uh, uh, yeah. It's, anyway, it's yeah. You know, even if the world ever devolves to the point where that's the way the world is, uh, stop the bus and I'm getting off. <laughs> uh, punch my ticket at that point. Well, I mean, it's also it's also kind of like the Gail Winand rules of relationships, you know. Uh, yep. He's, you is, know, is it a Gail Winand kind of world? Yeah. Is is she going to accept the diamond bracelet? Now, I'm not <laughs> saying that my approach is objectively right yet, but this is me, and I know we've got kindred spirits in our circle who who agree with that, and I appreciate it. I genuinely do. A couple more quotes here, real quick. Uh, oh, Robert Heinlein, of course, has a bunch about manners, such as moving parts and rubbing contact require lubrication to avoid excessive wear. Honorifics and formal politeness provide lubrication where people rub together. Often the very young, the untraveled, the naive, the unsophisticated deplore these formalities as empty, meaningless, dishonest, and scorn to use them. No matter how pure their motives, they thereby throw sand into machinery that does not work too well at best. Love that from Heinlein. You know, Eric. You know, well, I was going to say that, uh, I mean, I, Robert Heinlein, by the way, is just a treasure trove of quotes and aphorisms that are really, really nice um, and <laughs> very apt. Mm -hmm. But in this particular one, the social, the social lubrication, um, you know, oftentimes people say that alcohol is the best soup social lubrication but really it's manners <laughs> it's manners it's it put some love out there you'd be amazed how far love will get you yeah yeah put a some, little goodness out there i think jim said in yeah in the in the, someone someone said to him once that uh, manners are a form of respect absolutely yes, absolutely yep absolutely it's funny too because i've had people say when i've said you know respect should be the norm it should be the default and people have said to me before no respect has to be earned and like, well, yeah, in a sense, that's right. Obviously, respect has to be earned. But the strange thing is when you meet somebody and you assume they don't deserve respect until they give you some evidence of it. Right. That's not good. And that is wrong in about 10 different ways. It's just obvious right. that if you do that, neither one of you will budge. Neither one of you will offer 
anything. And that's all it's going not to even is. evidence of reasons to have respect. It's just going to foster disrespect and resentment, and uh, eventually maybe hatred. And it's irrational yeah. because the average person that you meet is not evil. The average person that you meet is out there doing his best to live his life. He may not be fully rational. He may not be your best friend. But he's not evil. He's not bad. He's got something to offer you, whether it's the gal at the coffee shop counter or the server at McDonald's or the waiter at a fancy restaurant or the cashier at Target or any of the other hundred people that you'll meet over the course of an average day who are not out to do you any harm. Anyway, not to get into the episode on benevolence because I have a couple more quotes real quick. A dying culture. Now, this is one for you culture warriors out there. Mm. And nowadays, isn't everybody one of the culture warriors? We're certainly playing our part in that. A dying culture, says Robert Heinlein, a dying culture invariably exhibits personal rudeness, bad manners, lack of consideration for others in minor matters. A loss of politeness, of gentle manners, is more significant than a riot. A loss of politeness, of gentle manners, is more significant than a riot. And I absolutely believe that that is true. It's why there are riots, is because people have given up on the good and believe that there's only one way to fight, by being nasty, as nasty as the people you're fighting. Yeah. That could not be more wrong, and in more ways than I can count. You know, it was Robert Heinlein who said an armed society is a polite society. Mm -hmm. Manners are good when one may have to back up his acts with his life. Mm. And that is just so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch uh, gears just a little bit and go to Eric Hoffer, who says, Rudeness is the weak man's imitation of strength. It's very easy to be rude and think mm -hmm. that you are strong, think you are in the alpha position by mistreating your friends or mistreating the wait staff. You know, they say one of the measures of a man is how does he treat people who have nothing to offer him, mm -hmm. who have no leverage over him? You can tell a lot about a guy by how he treats the waitress. Yeah. Yeah, we actually already had some comments in here. I think, Good. Uh, from. Um, we had a comment about, uh, yes, Stephen on uh, YouTube, he says, I treat wait staff well. I don't want people to be rude to me at, at uh, my job, so I feel it's important to act the way I would want to be treated. Exactly right. Absolutely. There's the old wisdom that if you start dating somebody who's married and they're willing to exhibit infidelity with regard to you, once you get that person away from their husband or their wife and you marry them, they're going to cheat on you. You now know this person is a yeah, they're, cheat. They're not necessarily. They're, they're not really going to be able to be trusted. I mean, that your trust comes from observing another person's actions, not yeah, just their what character, they say. their actions over time. Exactly yeah. right. And it's the same thing here. If you think, well, this person is good to me. He treats me well. He treats waitresses like crap. He treated the valet like crap. He treats friends who aren't very important to him like crap. But he's good to me. Do you think that that's not eventually going to come around you? And even if he kept up the charade over time, do yeah. you want to see that stuff when you're hanging out with this person? Is that the world you want to live in where people treat one another in that manner? Absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes when it comes down to seeing um, the, the person who is rude or inconsiderate or untrustworthy or dishonest, they're going to not just have a bad relationship with a number of different people in their life, but uh, primarily they have a bad relationship with themselves, uh, with their lack of self-esteem, with their, their lack of introspection, with their lack of trying to improve themselves and being honest with themselves about who they are and who, what they want out of life. Um, oftentimes it's a, you know, a situation where you've got a, a second-hander, you know, like a Peter Keating, for instance, is a really good example of that. But um, I just, by the way, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, we have a lot of comments. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, on uh, Facebook and the, YouTube. And the platform I, told me a while back we were already over 100 comments. And that to me is amazing because. It's wonderful. Thank you. You know, I know that, again, we at the beginning we had a conflict with the RN schedule. It's so great to see everybody in the chat. I haven't quite kept up with all the comments. And uh, Stephen here says, I say there's no human problem that can't be improved with more self-esteem. Yep. Though it's not the only thing you need. It's interesting. We talked on Thursday. Oh, we didn't talk. You weren't here. But we, I talked on Thursday about the fact that 
using Ayn Rand's definitions, pride is a virtue, self-esteem is a value. So in other words, pride is something you do, self-esteem is something you earn. You know, some people use pride synonymously as the value. The great thing about pride, and I think that's probably what Stephen's driving at here, that, that, that desire to live up to your own high standards, that refusal to do less than your best, to actually use pride, to exhibit pride, to take action with pride, to never be less than what you know to be the best, to be right. Um, in that sense, I would absolutely agree with what Stephen said. And uh, the unsigned 32-bit individualist, we know who that is, too. AKA, in fact, he's been a helper in our studio before. A.K.A. Mr. Halloween. <laughs> says, good point, Steve, about rude people. I agree fully that they don't have self-esteem, even though I'm sure that they think they have lots of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, when it comes to their version of self-esteem, they are full of it. Yes, absolutely so. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Lisa in, uh, on YouTube, she's like, I'm late with this comment, but I always love how you refer to the philosopher Brian May and such. I suddenly pay more attention. That's right. <laughs> I would do that anyway, but you now, know, given that he's also got a doctorate in astrophysics, yes. I mean, he's a PhD, and all the great philosophers are. Just kidding, but I love Brian May. I love the whole band Queen, but Brian May in particular, what a guy. I want to be him when I grow up. <laughs> I have one more quote here that uh, just because I love the whole upstairs, downstairs, and people working their way from lower classes to upper classes. If you haven't seen the series The Paradise, the only downside of it is it ended early. It only got renewed once, and then it really should have gone on. You've got this the first department store ever in England, and this young gal who's starting at the bottom and working her way up, and she's she's in the department of the department store where she has a boss over her who sees her as this charming and very attractive young lady trying to get the attention of the owner, uh, Mr. Moray. And she says that, uh, you know, it's obvious what you're trying to do. You're, you're trying to marry Moray. And she says, I don't want to marry Moray. I want to be him. Now, if that's not a selling point for a television series, the charming young lady who sees the, uh, the yeah, entrepreneur and says, I don't want to marry him. I want to be him. I wonder if we're going to have another up, another season of that show, or if it's ended. I'm not, I think it might be ended, but anyway, good good uh, viewing. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so, the Gilded Age was great fun, and I believe that one has been renewed for another season. So, I am looking forward to that. It's just we have to wait twelve months for it to happen, but that's so, going to be good. So Jim here has a um, a nice story. The nicest part of one of the days on his when he went to uh, Iceland for a vacation was when I stayed behind an Icelandic woman whose car stalled in a two-lane roundabout and waved people on through the other lane. I was there until a tow truck showed up about 20 minutes later, but I was in no hurry. I actually enjoyed it. That sounds like a lot of fun. And you kept, you know, you you, you made it so that it was safer for the, for the lady who, you know, was on the side of the road, that no one's going to hit her and that you were directing traffic and making people aware that there was somebody on the side of the road. That's awesome. And Being I'm so a happy gentleman that you is so enjoyed rewarding. it. You know, I actually, you know, this is very, very, something extremely small compared to that. <laughs> but I was actually out today driving. Um, I went to my uh, flamenco dance uh, practice. And uh, on the way back, I was, I had to pick up some food and I was kind of killing a little bit of time. So I decided just to kind of drive into a parking lot uh, it was a very unusual parking lot. It was kind of triangular, and there was all these, uh, you know, stores and shops and things set up that, that were not on a grid, I'll say. Uh, so I decided to just explore the parking lot and to see what kind of shops and things there were so that I could just be a little bit more familiar around that area. And uh, I found myself really enjoying being courteous to the people in the parking lot. So if there was somebody in front of me who was trying to back out of a parking space... Um, I would immediately, you know, stop to to indicate that they can they can come on out and then they can move forward. <laughs> anyway, it was just really nice because I know that sometimes if you're in a parking lot and you're backing out of a parking space, you're going to have some, you know, speed racer guy who is, you know, obviously has a sick grandmother in the hospital, of course, right? Or uh, a pet that needs to go to the vet, right? Um, who <laughs> drives past, doesn't stop, and it actually speeds up, you know, and you're like, oh, gosh, I'm so happy I didn't hit the guy. Um, yeah, so well, anyway, so I had a lovely little little parking lot experience. That, and everybody was actually, everybody in that parking lot, 
They were super polite and super courteous, and I so enjoyed my experience um, in a parking lot driving. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, Highly I, recommended. <laughs> I missed a lot of super chat here, and I, and I don't think I can really catch up with it. I don't know. We could do a whole second segment well, with just Q&A. But... Yeah. Well, now we don't have super chat. We... You can, if you'd like to support us um, and what we're doing here, you know, this has been over two years now we've been doing this and we're providing a lot of wonderful content. And, um, and of course, if, if we, we hope that if you like what we're doing, um, you might uh, send us a little tip or become a paid, a monthly Patreon supporter. Um, all of that information is at robertnacer.com. That's you true. You can find that. And, it, and Amy saw the website and says, oh, I got to update this one. Yeah, we need to update the website. Your website is horrible. <laughs> No, it's my not website horrible. is horrible. It's because but... I, I need wider power. <laughs> yes. Ayn Rand fans will get that reference. But there, but there there are some great comments and a few questions that I'm having a hard time keeping up with. Um, uh, Stephen says, tips for controlling emotions. I just got angry when I had trouble viewing your show. Um, because we were a couple minutes late. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wasn't angry, but I was disappointed. And the uh, I could give you a lot of tips for that, although I could I could have to do a whole show on it. One of the tips for controlling your emotions is to um, become impatient with them. Uh, it's also one of my tips for handling procrastination. I'll procrastinate later. So when I experience anger, I get indignant <laughs> at my own anger and say, well, I'm not going to tolerate that. Yeah. You can do the physical cues that change your emotional state, but you need to actually change the thinking to make it last. So sit up straight, shoulders back, chin up. I'm really angry. Uh, look up toward the ceiling and put a smile on your face. I'm really angry. Actually, I can't stay angry if I change that posture. It's biofeedback, and that means it's not lasting. You need to change the thoughts to fix it. But if you change it in the short term, it's easier to get to the better thoughts, and that's why it's effective. Again, I could give you other tips for that. Rethink, recategorize, but mostly subscribe to Gene Maroney's newsletter. Mm -hmm. Follow Gina Gorland. Follow the good objectivist psychologists. Yeah. Listen to Dr. Ellen Kenner. Yes. A lot of good information out there. If you can find the old notes uh, from Edith Packer on mm -hmm. handling your emotions, she was very good at that. Uh, let's see. The same commenter says, do you think it's indecorous to call a person out for engaging in small talk? What if I like what that person would call small talk. Well, it depends what you mean by call out. Uh, if they're being rude to you about it and saying, oh, why do you engage in small talk? Leave me alone. Yeah, yeah I guess that's kind of rude. Uh, if they say, you know, I prefer not to spend time on small talk. I'm just very busy these days. That's a whole different story. I don't think there's a problem with that at all. So it, uh, it depends on context as everything does. Yes. Oh my gosh, there's so much good stuff in the chat. I definitely uh, need to answer some of these later after the show. But first... Because we're, we're, we're getting on in time here. My point, my take home is in regard to standards, in regard to standards of your own decorum, your own style, your own level of graciousness, your own civility, but also in terms of how you conduct yourself on a daily basis, mm -hmm. it should be conscious. That's it. It should be chosen. You should have standards. This is how I want to be. It's great to model those so you can say in terms of my demeanor, I want to be... Well, I want to be more like Cary Grant. In terms of my, my sweetness or charm, I want to be like Fred Astaire. In terms of my level of toughness, you know, I don't want to be Steven Seagal. I want to be Dwayne Johnson. Uh, you decide, and you don't need to use characters like that. You can pull them out of fiction, or you can write them out abstract land paper, but it should be intentional. You should know the kind of woman, the kind of man, the kind of character that you want to be what you want to live up to. Incidentally to Stephen, that will also make it easier to have the kind of reactions you want to have because you've decided in advance, this is my approach when things make me angry, when things make me sad, when I am disappointed. We've done whole episodes on emotions. We'll do that again. The point is your emotions have a job to do. Let them do that job. Learn what you've got to learn and then move on from that. But yes, in terms of your personal standards, right? revisit them every now and then. Yes, yes. I know so many people who... In regard to any kind of advice, including the most trivial stuff, if Benjamin Franklin said to them, fart loudly, they would say not, well, let me think about that and decide if I want to incorporate that into my character. They would say, well, I'm just not that kind of guy. And I can hear the, the, 
the death knell. I can hear the bell yeah. ringing that their life is over. The minute you say about anything, oh, I'm just not that kind of guy. You've just given up on a world of possibilities. Now, there are all sorts of things I will never do because I'm not that kind of guy. But I will at least take that suggestion, that idea that comes to me, or that suggestion from somebody else and think about it and say, well, I'm not that kind of guy, but I could be. Or I'm not that kind of guy, but I can incorporate a little bit of that style or grace or boldness, that little bit of alpha maleness. I could be a little bit of that. If you're the kind of guy, the kind of gal who says, oh, well, that's just not me, mm. cut it out. So in regard to standards, yes, revisit them every now and then. Well, yeah, you, and that's yeah. what we're going to do this week. That's right. what I'm going to do this yes. week. Fewer t-shirts, fewer sleeping in days. <laughs> yes. And in that regard, and, and to put my money both, where my mouth both is. Of us. Both of us for that. To put my money where my mouth is, that's going to be my homework for the week. And specifically, what that looks like is I will be waking up every morning before 6 o'clock. Now, why do I pick that as a standard? Because it's a standard. It's concrete. It's specific. And it's easier to make it objective. And it's going to support my goals, which is to look great by the time we get to Ocon. I'll just have Amy do my hair and makeup, and I'll look like this. I'll look great. But I need to work on the swimming pool version of that. So, my homework, my take-home, my what I'm going to be doing, and you'll be able to be my accountability partners for this, is wake up before 6 o'clock every day and then take a picture of the clock. I'll probably use the uh, Amazon Echo device. We've got uh, one of the 5-inch ones. It would be good for that. Because, you know, if you do it with a clock, you know I wouldn't cheat, but, you know, you, you, you kind of want something where you look at it and you know he didn't cheat, even if you don't think he would ever cheat. So, we'll do it with the uh, Amazon Echo device. We'll say hi to her at 5.55 in the morning or whatever time it turns out to be. I'm stealing this. I've stolen this idea whole cloth from Jocko Willink, you know, the man behind extreme ownership and all sorts of other good, good, good stuff. Every morning he takes a photograph of his wristwatch, an Iron Man, Timex Iron Man watch, and posts it on Twitter. I don't know if I'll remember to do Twitter. I'm more of a Facebook guy. But I will take a picture of a clock every morning before 6 o'clock, Monday through Friday. We'll see about the weekends because a little different schedule for that and make that happen. You are welcome to join me on that path, on that adventure, that little bit of an upgrade that I am going to be doing. My post-it note for the week says, and this is only tangentially related, but the post-it note for the week is remove the oven oven door. (laughs) This is a story. A quick story. I told the story before, actually. We went over to a friend's house to repair her oven. Her oven wasn't working. It wouldn't heat up properly. And it turns out that uh, the igniter, one of the two igniters in the compartment, needed to be replaced, if you know anything about ovens. The things that makes the fire go whoosh and burn and stuff. little electric thing glows red hot. But the first thing you need to do when you go to replace the igniters in an oven is you need to remove the oven door, the big door in the front. I thought, well, this is going to be challenging. I know my own oven at home has screws and bolts, and I don't even know if I've ever removed it before. Maybe it's going to be hard. So I look it up. I go on the Internet, and that's great because you can find everything on the Internet. Is this a great world we live in or what? And it turns out the way that you remove the oven door from this particular oven she had, you open up a little bit, you know, so it's got a gap there, and you lift it up, and the door falls off. Well, it comes off. You just you just pull it up. You set it aside. It, there aren't even any like snaps or screws or locking tabs or anything. It's just gravity keeps this door in place, and it sits really firmly on the kind of hinges it had. But point is, I went to remove the oven door. Remove the oven door, and it was surprisingly easy. And the reason I need a post-it note, which I'm going to put up and look at all week. Uh, yeah, I'll put this one on the bathroom mirror. Sometimes I put it over my desk. This will be good for the mirror. First thing in the morning is to remind myself, don't awfulize. Don't catastrophize. Yeah, don't, don't assume, assume the worst. Don't assume things are going to be hard. You know, one of the problems with the news is the news reports on everything that goes wrong and very few things that go right. And they have to because if something goes wrong, you have to do something about it. You have to know it. It makes sense that the news is mostly bad news. But you don't want to do that in your personal life and assume that outcomes will usually be the worst case, not the best case. 
you know, I've, I've repaired everything in my house, in my studio, and I've replaced every conceivable thermostat and rheostat and potentiometer and piece of electronics, and I've repaired motors, and I've replaced motors, and I've repaired timers, and I've replaced, I've done all these things. And sometimes it's really hard, and sometimes it doesn't go well. And then you go to do the next thing, you think maybe this won't go well either, and that's the mistake that I need to stop making because I will get more projects done if I'm more eager to jump into them. And I will be more eager to jump into them if I can remember to remove the oven door. And sometimes removing the oven door turns out to be much, much easier than I expected it to be. I hope you find that experience to be useful to you, that you realize, oh yeah, there's some things I think are going to be really hard. They're actually probably not going to be, and I need to stop worrying about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the question is... Um why do we have a tendency to try to um, avoid disvalues or protect ourselves from disvalues rather than assuming the best and going after values? It's, yep. yeah. And, and, it, and it gets right back to that question of do people suck? Are most people rotten? Are most people terrible? Well, I go around all day. I go to the grocery store. I go to the department store. I go to the coffee shop. I go to a restaurant. I go to all these places and all the people are decent. And they, you know, serve me good food and nobody tries to poison me and the coffee is reasonably fresh. And if it's not, I can ask for a fresh one. And in the department store, nobody rips off my credit card. And the point is when you do encounter a bad apple, when your credit card number does get stolen, when that one in a million thing happens, it stands out because you've got to do something about it. You don't have to do anything about all the decent people out there. And that's a problem because... They don't stand out. You don't have to do anything. It's easy to take them for granted. Yeah. And it's easy to assume I need to worry about the bad apples. Right. And it makes the bad apples big. So that's why, you know, introspection is important is uh, kind of taking inventory of, of what is around you and where you are with yourself and especially what your habits are. So, you know, with regard to manners, with regard to um, automatized habits, you know, try to try to get to know yourself a little bit better. I know that I'm going to be doing some introspecting with regard to how I've been acting like such a, a such a, slu- a schlub. Um. I don't know. <laughs> to me, you look pretty and 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 wonderful every day. Well, um, uh, yeah, no, I just. Uh, but yeah, yeah, by all means, do I whatever certainly, upgrades you want to do. I I need to um, own my space a little bit better and not be so comfortable and kind of find more meaning in the things that I find around the house. Um, Well, I will say this. I will say this to you, Amy, Mm -hmm. and I will say this to all of the watchers and listeners out there. You deserve to be as good as you want to be. You deserve to be as awesome as you want to be. You deserve to be as stylish, as classy, and yes, you deserve your comfort zone too. But you have every right to reach a little bit higher. And that's what I'm going to try to do. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, try. Do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> or something. I'm just not that good at the Star Wars stuff. But it is true that if you say try, you've given yourself an out. Don't give yourself an out. Make that happen. So with that said, I hope everybody will join me on this journey over the next week of being a little bit better, a little bit... Well, I'm going to be up a little bit earlier. You don't have to do that. But rechecking my style, I'm going to throw out a whole bunch of old t-shirts and buy a few new ones. I'm going to throw out a bunch of old polo shirts. I like polo shirts, and they have a collar, but a lot of mine are from the work days. This is now a few years old. They just throw them out or send them to Goodwill, get some new stuff. Get up earlier. Get those workouts in. It's going to be great. Join me on it if you wish. If you do, let me know on Facebook. Share your updates. Share your information. Let us know how things are going for you. And with that said... All the show notes related to everything that we talked about today, all of that fun stuff, including the, the, the uh, well, how did I lose the front page of my show? Oh, here we go. Yes, in studio, including archive.org and the Library of Congress and, and uh, happy birthday to Jack Blaze and Kelly Carlson, all the stuff that we talked about, including our last two shows, one of which didn't have Amy in it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and the discussion about, it's all in the show notes. Posted within five, ten minutes after the show immediately, in the notes section of the episode. Yes. If you have ideas for the show, if you have things you're like, you need to do more of this thing that I say, do that. Put it in the show comments. 
or put it in our Five Minutes with Robert Naser Facebook group. If you go to robertnaser.com, you'll find a link not only to that group, but as Amy said, you magnificent people who are already supporting the show in in wealth-oriented financial ways. Oh, you're Thank so you. sweet. Thank you for that. You will find the links to Patreon dot com slash robert naser and paypal dot com slash robert naser so you could make a monthly contribution or a one-time contribution whatever works best for your situation we appreciate that love and goodness thank you for that and with that said because we're running a little over five minutes here i'm going to wish you a fine day i'm going to wish you success because i really want that for you we wish you the flourishing that comes from being reasonable and, and rational and you know, read, read The Virtue of Selfishness that we mentioned earlier by Ayn Rand, if you haven't already. If you have, reread The Ethics of Emergencies. You know, we think about the emergencies part, the trolley problem part, but there's so much benevolence in there, so much goodness. Reread that book. And as always, as oh my God, the comments are so great. I can't believe so many of you showed up. Despite the schedule conflict, you're, you're, you're making my day here. It's great. Thank you, guys. Uh, <laughs> and as always, we wish you 